Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from H.R. Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Have you heard of England, Charles? I was just about to say, I feel like this episode (laughs) is particularly special for you. Yeah. Being that you're a Brit yourself, people can probably tell by your strong accent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, You were born in London. Yep. Um, You have been living in the States for the greater part of three decades. Yeah. Uh, Lesser part of three. When did you 28 years. 28 years. I'm 30. That's the greater part. That's the greater part of three decades. Oh, man. So you're an honorary Brit, though. You're a Chelsea uh, yeah. football, soccer fan. Yeah, dual um, citizenship so, so, and everything. Aren't you special? Mm. Today's episode must be uh, exciting for you. Yeah, so today we're talking to John. Well, yeah, I, 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 I don't mean to interrupt. It's exciting for me as well, even okay. I'm not uh, a, a Brit. So I, I didn't yeah. want to just put this on you. Who are we talking to today? Today we're talking to John Scott. He was the keeper of the Royal Philatelic Collection in England for Her Majesty the Queen, uh, we're really excited to talk to him. I mean, he's going to talk to us about his personal history in in philately and because and the he, collection this, itself. This, this was a job that he got because he's so involved in the hobby and mm-hmm. he's so involved in the royal. He was really, uh, you know, sort of the, the the perfect candidate for this job and and uh, you know got to got to serve as the keeper of Her Majesty's collection. That's like I guess one of the, the one greatest of the highest honor. positions. Yeah. Somebody exactly that somebody yeah. in this hobby can can reach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it is the most extensive philatelic collection in the world for for stamps. Granted, they have access to things that us uh, mortals do not have access to. So of course, and that's why it is the most advanced philatelic collection in the world. Uh, it, it's it's again, it's got to be well, the highest honor for a philatelist I'm... to be appointed as the as the keeper of the royal philatelic collection. It's just I can't even imagine it. And not only that, I want to talk to to Mr. Scott about his own personal history, his yep. own dealings in ephemera and postal history, and not just you know filling stamps in an album. Talk mm-hmm. to him about what it means to be a postal historian in the truest yeah. sense of the word. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's bring him in. Hello, Mr. Hi. Scott. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Pleasant and correct. <laughs> Thank you it's so much good. for joining us. It's a bit warmer here today. It was minus not, minus nine in the wind chill yesterday, and today it's about plus nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, stark contrast there. We're used to that in uh, in New England ourselves. Yes, but that's, uh, oh, that's what I got. That's why one of my reservations about doing the ephemera, the annual ephemera conference in Greenwich in Connecticut, is that mm-hmm. you know by that time of year it's just about approaching spring here. And you go to America, and we stay with friends, and finds we have to dig out, dig the car out of the snow before we can get anywhere. <laughs> Everything is black and white. The waterfalls are still frozen. There's no green grass, no buds on the trees. Yeah. So it gets a bit depressing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does. It yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, where are you? That's a that's a fantastic room. I'm in our library. Wow. That is, um, that's which is fortunately just across the sort of drive from the house so it's 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 a separate entity which means that when when under covid you're not you can have reta- things that retail shops and other things are allowed to be open but mm. you can't have personal guests in your house mm. we can still have people here mm. so most of what you can see behind me is the postal history society library that's a uh, that's fantastic i love the the sunroofs there that's uh which it's started in ni- the society started in 1936. Mm-hmm. Wow! And so its its library is actually better than, say, the Royal's library in terms of postal history. Mm-hmm. Wow. wow! Do you mind just talking a little bit about your history with philately and and how yeah. you came to the position that you're in? I started off at the age of six when I was given them, my grandmother gave me a stamp album, and I was the only child who was the son of a, an ophthalmologist. And he used to, apart from working at the hospital, he used to have a private practice at home. And I guess they thought this was a great idea for keeping a young boy quiet on days when it was too wet or cold to go train spotting in the goods yard at Waverley Station in Edinburgh. So that's how I got into it. 
then at the age, I suppose in my early mid teens, early teens probably, I was given my late uncle's stamp collection, which was one of those wonderful Edwardian stamp albums, quite large in size. I mean, it was, I think it was the entire Commonwealth with a printed space for each postage stamp. Therefore, not something you could ever show to anybody except sitting next to you. And of course, at that age, uh, you don't have the resources to fill all the individual blank spaces. So you've got to have all stamps up to sort of 10 shillings value. And when it got to sort of one pound and 25 pound values, of course, you were stuffed. So each page <laughs> had a couple of blanks at the bottom of it. And I suppose that was what really put me off uh, traditional philately in the sense of collecting postage stamps. Because A, because I am i don't particularly like being told what I have to have or need <laughs> to have in order to have a complete collection. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have financial resources to do it anyway. <laughs> so in that case, um, why bother? So I, I sold most of the stamps by doing sort of adverts in stamp collecting and other magazines at the time. And then I went to a, was a dealer in Edinburgh who happened to have uh, a series of letters written by an intercom to Marshal Beres during the Peninsular War from describing all the battles he'd fought at between Bordeaux and Lis between Lisbon and Bordeaux. Wow. But being a, being a stamp dealer, of course, particularly in those days, and we're talking about the 1960s, he had never opened any of these letters. So, and they did have, they did have quite nice Falmouth packet letter marks on, which was the price he, how he priced them, but he'd never actually read them. And he had two charters signed by James the First or James the Sixth, uh, and Anne of Denmark, which again had signatures on them. Both Anne and James had signed them, uh, but again he, I think he assumed that the signatures were fake. Uh, so I bought both. I bought the collection of letters and the the two um, charters. Sold one at Sotheby's just to satisfy myself the signatures were genuine, <laughs> and the other one is still hanging on the wall. So that was what took me into away from stamps and into postal history. Mm -hmm. uh, but being Scottish, I then decided to collect the postal history of Scotland. And then you run up, you run up against exactly the same problems you have with stamps. You have a catalog, and that tells you how much the, for example, the Edinburgh Bridge ship letter costs, and there are only a couple of those known. And even if you can afford it, you have to wait till somebody dies to get hold of one. Mm. And I did have the first Peter Williamson postmark. Again, there's only there's only one of those known. But so you 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 can build up a very good collection of. A representative collection of Scottish postal history, but again, you need deep pockets to get the rare items, and you need to live for a long time. So that was when I moved into what some people rather disparaging call back of a book. So I now I'm more interested in nowadays in the social history, i.e., the content of the letter. So that's what took me to where I am today, really on what I would call social ephemera linked to written communications. Mm -hmm. So you've written over uh, 100 articles published since 1979 in, in all kinds of different publications. Can yep. you talk a little bit about what your focus has been on all those articles that you've published? It depends which who I'm writing for. Right, right. If I'm doing it for, say, the Journal of the Postal History Society, then it tends to be something that I would have researched in the archives or somewhere else. So it's more serious information or details about how something passed through a post. If it's for something like Stamp Collector, then it's very much about trying to persuade people to broaden their horizons beyond mm -hmm. uh, the simple stamp or postmark. Um, because I think that is how you interest a generation which is not brought up on stamp collecting. Yeah. So my, my articles, at the moment, I, the editor of Stamp Collecting, who I know you've, you've um, interviewed Matt before. Yeah, yeah. So he very rashly decided that he would like an article on every English, Scottish, and Welsh county. 
and I think being a bit younger than I am, he probably didn't realise just how many counties there were in Victorian England. So it's going to keep me going until about 2026, <laughs> writing well, one article well. one article a month. Wow. So I've just about got to the letter, initial letter S at the moment. That's um. When, when you were getting started, when you came across these letters or these documents that a, a, a traditional stamp dealer didn't have an appreciation for or a, uh, really the, the knowledge to, to price properly, did you expect the hobby to transition away from traditional collecting where you have a, a mint block and a, a used example? Did, did you anticipate that Philately would head in the direction that it's headed? Because now you go to an exhibit, or I'm sorry, you, look, you go to an exhibition and, and see the exhibits and there's yeah. much more of a postal history focus where the rates and the roots and the markings and the things that are not the, the stamp are, are quite often the focus. Mm. Did you ever expect that to become as prominent as it as it would? Yes, I think, well, partly because I hoped it would, um, <laughs> because that was my, per, having done a history degree, that was my sort of personal interest. Um, so it's been great that it has. I think it can, it, the great stumbling block in getting it to go further are, of course, the rules. Because if you have a thematic exhibit, you are very constrained about mm. what you can put in it. And, for example, I mean, you can have a wonderful collection of the town postmarks of somewhere, some village or town or city. But unless you can put some ephemera in there, it's very difficult to demonstrate why people are writing to one another over history. In other words, my first ever exhibit at StampX was about the, called the growth of a city's post. And it tried to explain why post offices opened in districts of Edinburgh at the time they did, which was very much linked to, you know, the expanding population, people moving out of the suburbs, factories developing in particular areas. Um, and to, to really inform that, you need to have the ephemera and not just the, not just the straight postmarks and stamps. So can you talk a little bit about the appointment to that position that, that, uh, that you had? Well, I think I was as surprised as anyone else to get it. Uh, <laughs> it was openly advertised. I mean, anyone could apply. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think uh, even people from America applied. Mm -hmm. But I didn't expect, as a personal historian, uh, I didn't expect necessarily to to get it. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, having started off as a stamp collector age six, um, and I've always I've been one of these people, I'm always interested in going to any subject on Philately provided it is well presented. In other words, I don't want to look at somebody's back talking to their stamp, not mm -hmm. talking to the people in the audience. Um, so I've always been willing to embrace and keep up to date with all things for the telephone. Um, but yes, I, I was surprised to get it. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, a lot of people have seen the Royal Collection. I mean, if you're lucky enough, you may even have been into the vaults. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it is, as I say, it is the world's, I suppose, the world's leading collection of its type. And you have the red albums, the green albums, and the blue albums, depending upon which reign you're, you're looking at. But I suppose the collection reflects the changing nature of Latley. Because and the albums are designed, as they were in those days, to be shown to friends, specialists, um, by personal invitation, really. Although King George V did extend that so that um, it could be exhibited once a year to the Royal Philatelic Society. But even then, it's limited to, uh, to fellows and members, so not even a, a guest could see it. But it was very much built up in the, by you know, King George V and Sir Edward Baker in an era when you would have had a page of one cent stamps, a page of two cent stamps, and so on through the issue. And very much dealing, very much concentrated on mid stamps as well. Uh, some used, but very little postal history. So that, that's where the collection rests, as it were. And then you went to the debate about should a collection be in aspect exactly as it was, as King George V knew it, which is almost too late because, of course, some quite a lot of material has been sold from the collection. So it really doesn't, it's not. In, it's not literally as he knew it. Mm -hmm. Or should a collect should any collection move of times? Um, I mean, when the royal collection is exhibited, for example, at StampX and other places, you see the sheets on the sheets as they're written up the album pages, 
as they were written up by Sir Edward Bacon. And because of the nature of a collection, it is also very much written up in the context of you either you know what you're looking at, mm-hmm. or the person showing it to you can tell you what you're looking at. Right. So that's the debate which has to be had, really, uh, and hasn't been yet as to whether the collection stays as it is. Do you acquire new material, showing, for example, how the stamp was, what purpose the stamp served? Do you describe it so you know about printing methods and designs? Um, so you come back to this question about is any collection either a living and developing entity, or is it a, a fossilized accumulation? Mm-hmm. Coming from the Jurassic Coast of Dorset, we know the value of fossils. Some years ago, the collection was exhibited or bit of it next to Prince Albert's collection of Monaco in Paris. Uh, so on the one hand, you had these pages containing wonderful material, but obviously taken out of a stamp. Obviously, the pages were designed to be in a stamp album, not be in an exhibition. And then next door, you had Prince Albert's collection done on the computer, the royal arms at the top, the gilt edge around the, around the page, uh, you know, huge contrast. As far as acquisitions go for the collection, was that largely uh, Her Majesty's decision or or the decision of the keeper? It, well, really, the decision of the keeper on recommendation to, to Her Majesty. Mm-hmm. Because, for example, they acquired the Kukubri cover. Yes. A block of penny blacks on it, mm-hmm. uh, which is hugely impressive. Um, but it is, I say, it's down to, it would be down to the, down to Her Majesty to decide right. on the recommendation of the keep. So Her Majesty is largely involved in the expansion and the sale of the collection itself on a day to day basis. Would you say that, that, she views the collection often as well i think she has she has enormous sentimental attachment to it Mm -hmm. and i think she really appreciates the family connection with this with this collection it is i say a family heirloom right and the question is i suppose what will future generations make of it and that of course we don't know well, right. and, and sort of piggybacking onto that what do you think it means to have a a monarch who collect stamps and who was involved in the production of a, a you know because in, in the 1930s we had franklin roosevelt uh who, who was very prominently a stamp collector and who inspired a lot of uh young kids to collect but but i feel like there's much more of a, a tradition of stamp collecting in the united kingdom going back to, to george v all the way up through uh through through her majesty and then you mentioned albert of monaco when you have a a uh such a public figurehead who collect stamps actively, what what do you think that does to inspire future generations of collectors? Do you think there's a, a big cause I mean, and effect there? Um, part of the problem is going to be that, you know, as Patrick was saying in his interview, um, in, the, in, in the old days, people collected stamps, then they stopped collecting stamps, probably when they left school, went to university, whatever, and then took it up on retirement. Uh, stamp clubs at schools have, of course, completely vanished. Uh, which I think is a great shame, because stamps, stamp collecting has a fairly poor image, particularly among those who don't collect stamps. And I remember my mother saying she she could always tell when a visitor to our house was a stamp collector, because they arrived wearing a, a raincoat or an anorak, uh, rather like a train spotter. Um, and we, we, we rather neglected the educational value of stamp collecting. If you can link stamps, postal history, and social history to the school curriculum, then I think you would teachers would realise there was much more to a philatelic society uh, than a postage stamp on its own or even a, an envelope on its own, because it's when you open the letter that you really get into the meaning of what well, the meaning of why people are writing to one another. Mm. You can't get more. That is why a stamp was invented. Um, and sadly, so collecting a stamp is rather far removed from why a stamp was created in the first place, because it wasn't created for collectors to collect. It was simply collected to facilitate the means of written communication. I mean, I remember I had one university, our lecturer was writing a, he wanted to write a book, I think, on the role of a spy during the Industrial Revolution. And he couldn't find out much about it. And so he set this question to his students. 
And of course, we couldn't find out much about it either. But had I had the ephemera and the newspapers that I do now, I would have had a great deal more. Well, I could have written a much well a first class degree rather than up a, sec- up a second. Hmm. Um, and it does so much information we have as collectors, which nobody else knows about, is locked in our vaults. And that's one of the, I mean, it's one of the, philately is a fairly introspective hobby. People talk to each other about it, but they never talk to anybody else about it. And then they wonder why nobody else is interested. And they're not interested because they know nothing about it. And that is why I I don't exhibit internationally, because I, frankly, I can't be bothered with the, the rules and regulations. And most of my collection is mounted on blue paper, because I think that shows off the ephemera which I collect, which on the whole doesn't have stamps or postmarks on it. And if it does, it's not the primary focus of interest. So I agree that, you know, if you're collecting shades of a tuppenny of halfpenny blue or something, you don't want your collection mounted on blue paper. Hmm. But if you're collecting white documents, and bear in mind they're all off-white, because that was how paper was made in those days, then it looks much better, I think, much more eye-catching, on a, not a bright blue background, but a, a blue-gray paper, than simply white on white on white and black ink. It just looks dull. I attended the um, the Ephemera Society meeting in uh, Greenwich uh, a number of years ago, and I've been to other paper shows, and it seems like, despite the obvious um, uh, connections between philately and ephemera, it seems like there's still somewhat of a, a, a gap that needs to be bridged. Is that a fair assessment of the, the state of both hobbies, would you say? That a lot of philatelists are not aware that this uh, whole exciting world of ephemera even exists necessarily. Mm. Mind you, I'm quite pleased that ephemera, ephemera collectors and dealers on the whole don't know much about postal history because it does, <laughs> it does enable you to transfer things between different markets and sometimes pick up really good buys in the ephemera market. And equally, sometimes, well, sadly, most dealers, now, most postal history dealers nowadays do at least open the envelope to see what's inside. That's been my greatest regret <laughs> because no longer can you open a letter and two lottery tickets fall out and you're still only paying a fiver for the left. <laughs> right, right. But that's why I, I did, well, I, I'm a, a lecturer for something called the Art Society, which has about 70,000 members in this country. And all my lectures are linked to the theme of written communication. So they are, for example, the development of decorative writing paper. And that's the one I'm doing at the Royal in next this December. Um, the Art of a Valentine, so it's all about the, val- the images on Valentine cards, the evolution of a postcard, uh, the Industrial Revolution, and then I'm developing a couple more. One is called the Victorian Way of Death, which is how Victorians transmit the, I- p- transmit the message about people dying through a post. Mm. You have Good Luck, which is the development of the state lotteries in this country and something like greetings for Victorian Christmas card. And these are all linked to postal history, but are accessible to anyone. And that is how I think we get people, we, we widen our market, not by talking to each other, by right. talking to a, a wider audience. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that on just a surface level, so many people outside the hobby would find interesting. Whenever I talk to people about morning covers themselves, they find that absolutely fascinating uh, you know that 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 news would be delivered in in such a way that you know almost know what's coming before you even open the open the envelope it's uh, people will I mean, be interested how do you, oh, how you break into that market because for example yeah. the art society it takes about a year to become one of their accredited speakers first of all you have to give them the subjects you want to talk about which is fairly easy then you have to invite them to a, a lecture you're giving on PowerPoint to a minimum of 50 people. Then you have to provide two professional referees. Then you have to speak to their education board for 20 minutes about the subjects you are going to talk about. Hmm. And then you get approved. And then you have to speak to a thousand people for two minutes in Central Hall in <laughs> London. And then you may or may not get invitations to speak. So. And that would be because stamp 
on the whole, stamp displays are done on boards, often with the person, as I say, facing the board rather than the audience. Um, most philatelic lecturers aren't, don't, aren't really equipped to talk to a wider audience, which is rather sad, but something that needs to be addressed. Mm. Yeah. So what else do you think we can do as a, as a hobby to kind of break, the, break through the barrier there? It, it seems like the barrier to entry to what you were just talking about is, is a little too high for the common collector, if you will. But common collectors, I mean, what would you suggest that they, that they do to get people outside the hobby interested in, in the philately adjacent uh, If you're doing interest? it now, I'd start a COVID collection. Yeah. Indeed, my, my wife has, because you get stuff coming through a post, which is either delayed by COVID mm. or has a special COVID postmark on it. And this stuff doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, the problem is, of course, getting hold of it at the moment because mm -hmm. there aren't any stamp fairs, so and it's not valuable enough to be on the whole to be for sale on eBay or Del Camp or one of these websites. But there's plenty out there to for people on modest means to collect. Yeah. It's just a question of how you get somebody interested who has doesn't know anything about it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's a pity that, for example, during. One of the most successful exhibits I've been to was, again, one organized by Patrick Masselis that happened in Yipa to, uh, to commemorate the First World War. And he had a, an exhibition in the town hall, in the free hall there, on the theme of the First World War. And no, sorry, was it First World War? Yes, it was. And because it was a it, the whole exhibit was on the same theme, it could be, it could be marketed to the public sense we had a big banner outside saying what it was and when we went to it there were people there lots of people there who didn't collect stamps and weren't philatelists mm. whereas if you go to stamp x for example i i would suggest that had the front hall had a themed exhibition on the trenches in the first world war rather than the high-end dealers who i think most people don't relate to, particularly at the beginning. So you had an exhibit there which attracted people in who didn't already collect stamps. Mm -hmm. Then I think that would that would actually be more popular than having high-end dealers up front. Then you get into the, the sort of middle-ranking dealers, and then you get a miscellaneous frames at the back on a whole variety of subjects, which again you can't. They, you can't sort of say all this exhibit is about the First World War. Come and have a look. Yeah. So if you yeah. went there looking for the First World War, you'd have a job finding it, frankly. And again, it's all on stamp album pages on the whole. Right, right. That's interesting. So you'd you'd uh, you'd suggest marketing exhibits to people just interested in history rather than looking for people looking for stamp collectors. You'd look for people interested. In the things stamps are talking about, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you never get beyond the stamp market. Right, right. You're only appealing to the people that are already in um, in the hobby. I think I believe uh, Dr. Gans Gans said that in her interview that we had to stop talking to collectors in order to get more people collecting. Yeah, and one other thing I do is, I mean, I I understand why they have the judging system they do, because one of the reasons people collect material is to win gold medals mm -hmm. and as soon as you disrupt the judging system and you can't get gold medals anymore then people won't spend the huge amounts of money they do on trying to achieve that <laughs> but equally i think there's plenty of scope for having a, a popular vote um mm -hmm. in other words in each section you would have anybody visiting the, ex the exhibit uh could uh vote on put a bit of paper in a box saying which was their favorite exhibit in personal history Automatics, without mm -hmm. regard to any judging criteria, and then I think that would persuade people a to look at the exhibits more because they would think they could contribute to it. Even more possibly, if you gave them a prize to the winning, you know, the first one out of the box yeah. uh, got a prize themselves, they might be more willing to do it. And I think that would it might increase the sort of visual appeal of some of the displays. Yeah. So if I can, swinging the focus back to a, a little bit of the, the royal collection, is, is any of the material 
since 1953 been exhibited and how has it been exhibited? Yes, it's not exhibited. unmounted. Yep, it does get exhibited. Mm -hmm. um, for example, some of it went to Monaco. Um, I keep saying thinking last year, it's actually 2019 now, isn't it? <laughs> um, so some of it went, a few pages went there because it was, a, the idea was to have a few pages from each reign Mm -hmm. of all the monarchs so some of it did get there but very little of the present reign is mounted compared to previous reigns mm -hmm. oh go ahead charles i, I was just going to no, ask Mike, if Mike, after you i was just going to ask if if other members of the royal family are involved or interested in the royal collection as well um well the there are various collections belonging to various members of the royal family, mm -hmm. like like the Princess Royal and Prince of Wales. Um, but, but, I mean, as you would expect, members of royal family travelling get sent all sorts of things right, right. Uh, for the collection. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask a little bit about your own uh, uh, personal dealings uh, in, in terms of uh, 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 ephemera. Do you find that a lot of the people you're selling to or buying from are people who are uh, specifically postal history or ephemera collectors, or are there people who just want, um, you know, a letter written to their hometown or sort of non-collectors who ha there's, see something with a, with a sentimental connection? What, what do you see in terms of the market, uh, in, in terms of your own personal dealings? It's a mixture of postal historians wanting material that will illuminate their collections. You know, it's making slightly less dull than they would be if you simply had a village postmark in red, blue, black, and green. Mm. Um, and then they are ephemeral. They are, there are ephemerists, of course, who are probably the biggest market, people who collect anything to do with cabinet making, porcelain, or any of those themes. And then there are people who find things that, for example, we had a, an invoice from the Rainbow Inn in Fleet Street. And I think a lady in she might have been in Australia. Her ancestors used to run the pub and were the inn and were named on the inn. So that's why she was very keen to acquire the, it wasn't a spe spectacular looking inn receipt, but it just, you know, if you're, if you go out there wanting to find something from the inn your family used to run in 1840, the chances are you won't. <laughs> Take what you can get. <laughs> so there is a huge market for that, for that, for that material. The only problem, and the internet is ideally suited to it. The only problem is that we have 20,000 odd items in our collections and stock. And admittedly, lockdown has given me the opportunity to, to scan about 800 of them. Scanning them, describing them, getting them, getting them on the website does take time. And we discovered it's not something you can easily delegate to somebody mm. because even when I was um, obviously I have connections in the city of London by virtue of being an elected councillor there and one of our responsibilities is the London Metropolitan Archive <coughs> and some years ago they were restoring the documents and I asked them if they were re recording the watermarks and they weren't it hadn't occurred to them to record the watermark when they had this piece of paper out and often a watermark is the only way you can date a piece of paper. Mm. It tells you who might, might tell you who made it and when they made it. So not to record it came across as a huge surprise. When you look at an invoice, okay, a sort of mid 19th century invoice with engraving on it, there's so much there that needs recording. And you never know whether it's going to be the name of a person, the name of a printer, the place it came from, the business they were in. Um, there are 101 reasons that somebody could collect that piece of paper and making sure you describe it all and when you're scanning it and putting it on the website does take yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. If I could get all 20,000 images on our website, it'd be great. If I could persuade Getty Images to go back in time and realize there was life before photography, that would be <laughs> even better than I could sell the whole archive to them. So if you know anyone who gets from Getty Images, Told them they're missing an opportunity. 
Right. You you said it's it's quite an effort, and it's not something you can you can kind of just outsource. Is there or is there an initiative to find find someone to help you with this that, of a younger generation that you can almost train and and mentor to do what what you're doing? There, you would think there would be. Right. But when we have tried to employ people, which we have done mm-hmm. with computer degrees, um, they are quite determined. They know best. Mm. And mm. they will do exactly what they want to do. And when you ask them at the end of the day why they haven't done what you asked them to do, they it turns out they weren't really interested in doing what you wanted them to do. They were interested in doing what they wanted to do. Mm. It's not why you employ somebody. <laughs> right. This is maybe a generational thing. Right, right. It almost volunteers would be would be better uh, than, than... Yes, vol- volunteers uh, would be ideal. But... <laughs> and you can get those if you're running a, you know, you're running an archive or a library. I right. mean, uh, for a local authority, for example, or charitable, you you can get people to volunteer. Mm-hmm. It's much more difficult to get people to volunteer to something that is a quasi-commercial mm. en- enterprise. Right, right. That's a difficult uh, scenario to to be in. Is something that 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 needs so much work on it, and it and takes so much time and there's not enough people to kind of put the work into something that's so important there's a lot of documents out there that that tell history and and might even change history in the books that we currently have that just aren't haven't been like you said the letters haven't been opened the Hmm. people aren't paying attention to that kind of material a few years ago we got rung up by somebody who had found three trunks in the loft Mm -hmm. and First of all, they, for some reason, they dug out some book matches and thought, what do we do with these? So I think they went on to eBay or something like that and said, we have this huge collection of matchboxes, or book matches, I don't know which they were. And some dealer came back and said, well, I'll, I'll, sight unseen, I'll offer you £50. <laughs> and they decided that actually £50 was neither here nor there. And they didn't really about it. And the dealer came back and said a few weeks later, haven't heard from you, I'll offer you a hundred pounds, still sight unseen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they thought this was rather odd. Perhaps there was more to this collection than they realized. So we then got in touch with Stanley Gibbons. And Stanley Gibbons said, as people do when they got stamps, uh, Stanley Gibbons said, well, we'll, we'll sell off the trunks, you know, as, as one lot, as three lots. So trunk A, B and C. So they weren't very impressed by that either. Unfortunately, there was a letter in one of the trunks from the to their grandfather from the Secretary of the Postal History Society, commiserating with, on the loss of their grandfather. Mm. And their grandfather was Richard Burton, not the Richard Burton, not the film star. Um, but he was, um, he, his girlfriend back in 1914 was Florence. And they got married and he went off to war and Florence ran the post office in a village called Sawbridgeworth in Hertfordshire. And when he came back from the war, of course, the woman got sent off to the kitchen to have a family, and he became a postmaster. And during the Second World War, I think he was probably looking forward to his retirement. And so he decided for quite fun to buy stamps and postal history. So one of the lots he bought from Robson Lowe in 1944 and 12 for 12 and sixpence which is what 50 pence today so not a great deal of money hmm. um was 25 letters from the interesting letters from the crimean war and um, he then sadly he retired he died shortly afterwards because in those days of course annuities were very carefully calculated so that you knew somebody you all could almost guarantee somebody would be dead very shortly after their retirement age, uh, because that's what happened. Um, so he died, and then the whole lot got put in the loft and didn't get taken out until they found this connection with the Postal History Society and got in touch with us. And so we went through boxes, found these 25 interesting lessons of Crimean War, and two of them turned out to have been written by somebody who was on the field of battle at the Charter of Light Brigade. And I dare say they hadn't been opened since they were received in 1855. <laughs> because back in the Second World War, on the whole, well, 
with a description like that, simply 25 interesting letters from the Crimean War, mm-hmm. it's unlikely that anybody actually read them. So I was probably the first person to read them since 1855. Wow. And that is, that's the fun of postal history. Yeah. Each letter has a, a story to tell. And that Incredible. is why, that is the great drawback of having an envelope, of course. Mm-hmm. The envelope was almost the death of postal history because in the social sense, because it enabled you to separate the content from the, from the cover. Right. So right. you only have half the story. And I think, was it Patrick who was talking about the, or one, somebody was talking about, you know, the stuff in the archive. Um, it might even, no, I think it was somebody from the, looking at the stuff in Kew Gardens, and they've got all the records from the early explorers, mm. which of course didn't, didn't keep the envelopes. They threw the envelopes away, so just have the content. <laughs> And I yeah. went through the, one of the archives I did go through was the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's archive in Lambeth Palace, thinking it might contain treasures for missionaries. But of course, most of the covers, most of the outsides have been thrown away. Hmm. And they simply have the inside. But they did have the world, the only known copy of the first postmark ever used in Barbados. Oh, wow. And they, did, they didn't realize it, of course. <laughs> It is literally the only one that's so far been recorded. Wow. Wow. I, well, if stories like that don't excite people into wanting to collect postal history and ephemera, I, I don't know what what would. I mean, the, mm. there's just so much out there that that is yet to be discovered. It, it's, it's fascinating. And that is still happening right now. I think Trish was talking about discoveries from the Civil War postal history that she's making even now. It's just... It's fascinating stuff, this stuff that's hidden in attic, people's attics. And... One thing that people don't collect but could do are old, well, not old fashioned, to me, well, they are old fashioned nowadays, air letters. Because when you think about an air letter, it's, an, it's a real throwback to the days before the envelope. Mm-hmm. You know, it's when you open it, you've Absolutely. got the contents and you've got the whole thing is on a single sheet of paper. Yeah. And one of the letters I bought by accident last year. And I was just thinking, I don't know if you've had a, a series, we got a series just ended on television called The Serpent. And it's about that man who murdered all backpackers in Nepal and Thailand in the 1960s. Oh. I mean, he literally murdered tens of dozens of people. Wow. And stole their money and their passports. And uh, indeed, he's still in jail in Kathmandu. Wow. He was a uh, wow. French guy, and I got this air letter, and it described how this this backpacker was making his way by sort of coaches and everything through Afghanistan to Nepal, places you couldn't go to nowadays. I mean, you wouldn't get on a bus in Afghanistan <laughs> in a hurry nowadays. But in the 1960s, you could do that. And this air letter tells you all about his his travels through through to Nepal. And his experiences. Wow. That exact, exact s- the, same guy. Sorry? Is this yeah, the single air letter? Wow. Tells you all his trips and his experiences getting on the wrong bus in Afghanistan and discovering he was on a bus with a load of convicts. <laughs> this has been fascinating. That's this fascinating. Been, stuff. Uh, yeah, That's no, incredible. this has been a, a, a really fantastic talk. But how yeah. do you get? How do you tell these stories to people? Ideally, it needs to be, I mean, a, a podcast. I suppose different between a podcast and a broadcast is that sadly a podcast <laughs> doesn't reach as many people as a broadcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you get onto this stuff onto onto the into the mainstream media? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think universities could be more help than they are. Yeah, we have such Absolutely. fascinating material which is relevant to anyone doing historical research. Mm-hmm. It's almost what I was just about to to say is that universities and, and colleges here would would benefit greatly from allowing lectures or, or speeches or, or stories like these to enter into uh, their their campuses and, and their history majors and everything to, to hear them. And it would get people interested. It would get people excited and it would get us more researchers, people more uh, excited about 
philately and postal history and ephemera. Sadly, you always have this gap between the amateur mm -hmm. and the professional. Yeah. And the professional doesn't trust the amateur, <laughs> despite the fact the amateur often knows more about a specialized field than, field than the professional does. Mm. I think that's why I prefer the French, because the French word, of course, is amateur. By that, they mean the lover of an object, not somebody who is just a, it's just a hobby. Yeah. Um, and we need to bridge that gap between, we need mutual respect between professionals and collectors. Yeah. So they, they realize what we can add to their profession. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't agree more. But Mr. Scott, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to meet with us. Um, this has been fantastic. This has been fascinating. We probably need to shorten it a bit because we've had 45 minutes now. <laughs> no, not at all. There's not a thing I would take out. This has been, um, this has been really, really fascinating. Really been great. Uh, thank you so much. I've, I've, we've really enjoyed this. Uh, yeah. No, so have I. That's Thank good. you. Bye. 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 Have a good rest of your day, okay. Michael. I really enjoyed that. I thought that was uh, that was great. And we're gonna have to try and get to London in December. I would love to see yes. uh, love to see Mr. Scott speak in person. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm. I definitely look forward to that because hearing him speak about the things that he sounds so passionate about is it. It would just be fantastic. And I completely agree he, with his sentiment that that we need these lectures, we need these speeches in universities. And he gets in the colleges. storytelling aspect of yes. it. He gets that it's not just about, you know, the printing method. It's all important, interesting information. I'm not knocking any of that, but right. but it's about telling a story. And and mm -hmm. you can tell that that's what interests him and that's what he uses to to fuel his own research and writing and, and ultimately his business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the printing method aspect is is valuable because we need those those the, we need that kind of information for expertizers. Right. We need. I was not knocking that part. No, no, no. I understand. I'm just. <laughs> I know that. You know, we need those people so that we can enjoy the hobby, knowing the things that we're collecting and buying are real, essentially. So we need people Absolutely. to 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 study that aspect, and there are people that are interested in that part of the hobby, and we need them. We need every single piece of, of the course. hobby working together, and his the what he talked about was was absolutely vital and, and and if we can get to london in december we should do like a <laughs> vlog like an episode on the road like yeah absolutely going to london for uh for a for a philatelic ephemeral talk i think would be a lot of fun now before we wrap up today you've yes. read listener mail in the past it's true which i think is awesome you check the email so you get all the listener mail so you mm -hmm. are the one who reads it but i feel uh left out at that point okay so uh, what I was going to do, and, and you see these as well, but I have equal uh, access to them as you do. I was going to read a couple of tweets, if that's okay. Go for it. Which um, which feels uh, like I'm on a late night show. But right, I was going to say, is this, uh, yeah, I was just going to no, say, is this Jimmy Fallon's mean tweets? Exactly. No, I left those mean tweets out. The people mm -hmm. who say they hate our show. Perfect. I don't see those either. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to read three of them really quick. The first is from Peter at mm -hmm. Stamp Den. Who uh, if, I said, if I may just ahead. interject really quick, he had a fa fascinating article in the AP uh, this past uh, for this issue. On, well, I haven't um, read this issue plan. yet. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. He's okay, got. I he's need like to go the read first that. It's literally in sitting. The AP. It's sitting on my desk. Then so. Yeah. Um, well, Peter said, "Love the latest episode of Conversations with Philatelists about the second all improved StampX in March. I've registered at StampX.vfairs.com and I'm looking forward to the talks, booths, chat rooms, and exhibits." I think this is awesome that we got at least one registrant to StampX uh, because of our, I think, you know, if yeah. nothing else, like we got one. Uh, mm -hmm. That makes me feel really great to hear that. Um, so I thought that was a, a, a really kind tweet. Yeah. Yeah. He's a fantastic um, guy. Wait, I, I don't know him personally. He I've seems just like, seen him on. No, yeah, but he but, seems uh, like that's a fantastic the, guy. I feel like we know all these people on Twitter, right. though, which is right. fun. Like I see these people's little avatars pop up and it's like yeah. uh, another great one. This was uh, from Musical Stamps at mm. Musical Stamps. Uh, I said I was listening to convos with philatelists, trying to stay under the uh, character limit. Love that mm -hmm. convos with philatelists. I, uh, I like uh, at Michael J. Court and at Charles L. Epting, uh, and learned about adversity covers from Trish Kaufman. Visited her site and found this awesome cover made from piano sheet music, uh, which is so cool that somebody mm -hmm. took sheet music and folded a cover out of it. Yeah. Um, hashtag musical stamps. I'll be writing about it soon. So we directed someone to Trish Kaufman's website. And they found something that fit right into their collecting interest. 
Incredible. It's awesome. Also got a yeah. very nice note from Trish lately mm -hmm. uh, about the podcast. So I, I love the follow up even after months later that these mm -hmm. things live on. I think it's cool. So Yeah, I showed uh, that tweet to uh, my wife, Kaylee, who's a musician. Um, she loved that because she thought it was so fascinating that, yeah, someone had sent a letter on, on sheet music. And she's not a philatelist herself, but she just found this part, the overlap there of, of philately and music was, was interesting to her. Absolutely. And then the last one I wanted to read really quickly uh, is from Israel Stamp Reviews. This is at stamp underscore Israel, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the username handle. got cut off. But it's the handle. That's the word. Got cut off. But this is from Israel Stamp Reviews. Uh, responding to our Roy Betts interview. Mm. Uh, this one's in my top five, maybe top three. I could tell you guys were struggling to decide if you want to be an audience or the hosts. <laughs> yes. Hit the nail on the head with that one. Uh, at our bets too it's such a captivating storyteller it's almost a shame to interrupt him uh, but all, as always you struck just the right balance i agree i think uh, mr roy bet should host this show instead of us <laughs> uh and i would listen to that every week yeah um but but again a huge thank you to uh, israel stamp reviews musical stamps and uh, and peter mm -hmm. uh for mm -hmm. those really kind tweets i love seeing yeah. those um i'll admit i'm not the best at using twitter uh that's not much of a confession anybody who follows me knows that <laughs> Um, but, but when I see things like that pop up, it really does make me happy. And, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to, to call out those three users in particular for being so kind and, uh, and, and supportive of the show, I think is just amazing. Yeah, those were fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing those. Again, I, I saw I just those. I think it's those really fun and, when, yeah, I, you don't have to keep reminding me that you saw them. I want to feel like these are my <laughs> contribution to the show, but I've, I know you saw them as well. Because great we, to we hear were both those. Tagged I've, never, in all of them. I've never seen them before. That's thank you. That's what yeah. I like to hear. Yeah. Um, no, again, these tweets really make me happy. Again, uh, I uh, normally am inconvenienced by Twitter notifications because <laughs> uh, of my just general uh, disdain for the app. But when it is uh, when it's actually something really nice, it makes yeah. me like Twitter. I just picture Twitter as such a toxic place. Mm -hmm. Because that's sort of the, the consensus for like the last decade or so. Mm. But then you get tweets like that and it's like there's really nice people. Yeah, maybe there too. is good in the world. Maybe there is good in the world on stamp Twitter. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, though, it, it, in all seriousness, these tweets uh, really do brighten my days and, mm -hmm. and make me really happy. And I love reading them. So yeah. uh, if, if you want to follow us on Twitter, uh, at Michael J. Court, not to be confused with Michael J. Fox. And uh, at Charles L. Epting. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. That's true. So uh, thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Uh, our website is flatlypodcast.com. Our email is flatlypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, Michael, this has been really fun, as yeah, always. That, absolutely. Thank you to um, Mr. Scott for taking the time out and... Uh, Thank you to all the people listening. It's been fantastic. I'll see you next time. Talk to you soon, Michael. All right. Bye-bye.